my name is John Wilson, and I am chairman of the uh, president of the hydrology section of AGU. And every year we uh, sponsor the Langbein Lecture. Uh, it's a, an effort that's been going on for some time now. I don't recall exactly how much. It is my great pleasure today to introduce John Shockey of, the, of NOAA and the National uh, uh, Weather Service as our speaker, talking on water, weather, climate, and our future. What can we know? John uh, was my professor 41 years ago. We were just uh, <laughs> relating, which dates him more than it dates me. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I am very much looking forward to, to, to this uh, occasion. So without further comment, uh, John Shockey, uh, our 2009 Langbein lecturer. Thank you. Thank you very much. It is, I cannot tell you how surprised I was in August when the phone rang and John called and said, uh, would you uh, accept the Langbein Lecture Award? And I thought, oh, that's a wonderful honor. And said, sure, 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 I like that idea. And then about 10 minutes after I ended the phone call, I started thinking about what I had just agreed to do. <laughs> and, and I've never, ever spoken to more than about 150 people at one time. And never have I spoken to such a wide audience. So it is indeed, uh, a challenge to uh, attempt to do this. Um, I, I'd like to first of all thank, uh, give some thanks to John and uh, the past uh, leadership of the uh, of our section for setting up this award and this, creating this wonderful opportunity for someone each year to say a few things about the areas of science that they care about and helping us all get a broader sense of what all of our work in AGU might be about. And I'd like to, I found out that Steve Burgess nominated me, and I'd like to thank him for that nomination and for his perseverance to get this through the committee because there are lots of people, candidates that could be here to talk to you now. So I feel very fortunate to have this opportunity. I'd like to thank the committee that selected me for doing that. I'd especially like to thank my family. Uh, my wife is here. Uh, in fact, she reviewed an earlier version of this lecture and ripped it all up. <laughs> and I deleted half the slides, reorganized what was left, and uh, thought real hard about what I was trying to do. And I really am indebted to her for her help in so many ways. And I have with me my daughter, Lauren, and her husband, Jake, who's a geotechnical engineer. They live up in Truckee. It's on Interstate 80 up going past uh, Sacramento up over to Wardrino. And I have two daughters that live there and two granddaughters, and one of those daughters is here. So it's a pleasure to have them. And I'd like to, of course, thank many of my colleagues for their help and under and what I've gained from them, the support, the, it's been just a truly exciting career in hydrology with so many wonderful people. I'd like to thank some of, many of my past students that I have learned so much from. I've learned, I cannot tell you what I've learned from the people that I'm around, especially the younger people. And I'd like to thank uh, the NOAA and the National Weather Service for the opportunities they have given me, and I especially like to recognize the current leader of the Weather Service Hydrology Program. His name is Gary Carter. He has created, he's a fantastic manager, and he has created a wonderful opportunity for the hydrology program to contribute to many of the needs of our country and to be connected in a very sound and a highly strategic way with the science community again. So it's, that office has been a fantastic office for many, many decades, but now I think it's got some of the strongest leadership it ever had, and I like to recognize that. And of course, I'd like to thank every one of you for coming, and I hope in the end you find this a rewarding, a rewarding talk. 
First, I like to offer a tribute to Walter Langbein that the lecture is named for, just recognizing some of his many contributions that are listed there. So some of you don't know who he was. Uh, he was with the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, within that organization, one of his important contributions was to establish what's called a systems group. The first uh, leader of that was Nick Metallis, who I doubt if is here today, and uh, Bob Hirsch, who was the chief hydrologist of the USGS for many years until just recently, headed that group too in his career. Walter made some very important contributions to the science community, including helping to establish water resources research. He was one of the first co-editors with Alan Kinesa. He was he helped to to create the, the the concept of the UNESCO's International Hydrologic Decade and to develop some data sets that were put together about the about the world's rivers during that time. And that data set is some of the most valuable hydrologic data that uh, still exists today. And Walter was instrumental in making that happen. I also found out that he was instrumental in getting the University of Arizona to form its hydrology department. And so uh, he has, among his, I knew Walter, I met him when I finished my graduate work at an urban hydrology, an ASCE urban hydrology research conference in 1965 and uh, had wonderful opportunities to talk to him after that on many occasions. Um, one of which was when I was, I had decided to go to work for the Weather Service and left MIT. It turned out that the hydrology department in Arizona was looking for someone to chair the department. And he called me up and suggested I apply for that position. Well, that would not have been a good idea. I think the department's much better off that I didn't apply if they'd have selected me. That would have not have been a good thing. There are a number of other times in my life that I made decisions to not do things that turned out to be everyone's benefit. <laughs> so uh, just a few thoughts about my journey in hydrology. And the slide has uh, <clears throat> two columns there. I'd like to talk about the right-hand column. And you can see some of the places that I've been and some of the, or some of the things that I may have been involved in. I started out in graduate work, working on a urban <clears throat> runoff problem. We were looking at a project with a, that was funded by the city of Baltimore at Baltimore County, state of Maryland, and the Public Roads Commission, it was called Department of Transportation at the time, to <clears throat> try to get a better understanding of how water runoff occurred in cities. And that project had been going on for many, many years, and I was very lucky to get to be part of that at a certain time. And the, uh, we, we had a, a, a panel of sponsors and engineers that met every few months to review what we were doing and provide some kind of guidance to it. One of the leaders of that was a man named Carl Izzard, who worked for the Bureau of Public Roads and had conducted a bunch of overland flow tests back in the 1940s. And he felt that we should, first, before we tried to figure out how water came off of areas that had paved areas and brass areas, pervious areas, we should first of all see if we can just simulate what happened on the paved surfaces. So I was guided to try to figure out how water f ran off of a parking lot or a street segment. And that, in fact, was what I did my PhD thesis on. And I, <clears throat> in order to do this, we had instruments that we measured the rainfall, we measured the flow of water into, into the inlets and so forth. And back in those days, we had no digital equipment at all. And so getting, just to keep that stuff running was a challenge. So any time that it would start to rain, we had, my wife and I had four kids during a time we were in graduate school, or I was in graduate school. So the thunderstorms would come and John would get up from, the kids were screaming and the, 
So I had to go and make sure this stuff would, and I was also interested in watching the water run down the gutters to see why, how, how could I ever tell a computer that that's how this thing worked. And uh, so they put up with me and I, well, we got the equipment, we had, to, we had rain gate, we had to make it work ourselves. And so it was really neat to get there and see what it's like to get real data and, and deal with that. I don't want to do that again, but I was glad I got the chance to do it. Anyway, uh, so we, we got great success with that. I wound up, my, when I was working on just some, I was, it, mindless almost approach to trying to analyze this stuff and my advisor came in one day and he says well what are you doing and this was only a few months before I wanted to finish I showed him and he didn't like it and he said John why don't we just think about what actually happens and I said to him his name was John Geyer Dr. Geyer and I said you know I've been thinking about that too but to do that I'd have to you know I was thinking about it, I could solve the unsteady flow equations the St. Venon equations and see if they would work. He says, hmm, why don't you do that? <laughs> well, John didn't know what a partial differential equation was at that time, much less how to get a numerical solution. To do that with computers, with punch cards, where you get one turnaround a day. But by golly, I figured out how to get a solution to that and with the full equations, with all the terms in it, all the inertial terms, which cause all kinds of havoc, I found out in doing this stuff for very shallow flows. Like I'd start from a dry pavement. And that was, <laughs> what a challenge. I learned that the, the mathematicians in our, at Johns Hopkins, where I was, went to school there, had no clue about how to do anything useful with mathematics. <laughs> I, geez, at all. They had no way to help us. So that was a, so I learned a lot of stuff there. Anyhow, I, uh, after doing all that, at that time, there was a program at Harvard called the Harvard Water Program, and I was wanted to go into the academic world. My advisor suggested to me that you should go on to do a postdoc, and uh, you should go to one of two things. You should either go to Harvard and work with Harold Thomas, or go to Stanford and work with Ray Lindsley. And I wanted to go in some other directions, so I went to Harvard. And it was very rewarding and got involved with the um, economics and public policy group, but also in my own graduate work, I really majored in applied mathematics. I thought that the most important thing that I could know, and it would still be useful to me 50 years after I got my degree, would be what I learned about applied mathematics. So I took any course that I could while I was there that they'd let me take, because I had to take some required courses in my department too. Uh, having to do with that. And then I went on to Harvard and I spent time with Harold Thomas and Mike Fearing and learned more about stochastic processes and synthetic hydrology was a, a up and coming topic at the time. But then, uh, and then I went on to do some teaching at the University of Florida at MIT. I was interested in water resource systems analysis and applying all those ideas to help make better decisions with respect to investments in water projects. The only thing is, at that time, and this is now beginning into the early 70s, it was very clear that this country wasn't going to build too many more dams and that the focus needed to be in operating the systems, not in building. I mean, there were more decisions to be made on the, on the planning side, but much more to be done in operating these, get the most out of them. So the Weather Service gave me an opportunity to come work in the Office of Hydrology and lead the research activities there, and so I took it. Because I thought the future, a, a big part of the future in hydrology was in that direction. And I'm really glad that I made that decision because well, in order to make this work, we had to have the forecast of what was gonna come into the reservoirs or whatever. And we didn't have that kind of knowledge at the time. And so I went there to work on that. After I got there, there was a lot of issues started to develop with the climate system. And Jerry Nemich, who headed the hydrology program at WMO, came to visit us in the early 80s. And I uh, decided to, uh, oh, I didn't start, what's, how much time have I used? This timer? <laughs> 15 years. 
I've used 15? Okay, got it. And uh, I'm on slide two. <laughs> <clears throat> so if we don't finish all these slides, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I, ha I hope I have a lot of worthwhile things to say, but in any case, where was I? Um, where was I? What was I saying? You don't, you don't remember. Uh, Jerry. Jerry, it's a test. Does anybody remember? Okay. <laughs> Jerry Nemich was uh, head of the hydrology program at WMO, and he came to visit us, and he was interested in the sensitivity of hydrologic the rivers to possibilities of climate change. And so I worked with Jerry, and the two of us wrote the first papers on the question of what would happen to the and the we discovered the rivers would amplify the effects of climate change, and so we wrote a number of papers about that stuff. And then uh, I also realized I needed to not just do climate work, that I had to do some good, good stuff for the office. They were doing flood, pred flood prediction and so forth. So I really didn't continue in that area as intensely as I might have, but I got interested and worked there. But then in the end, the GWEX program came along, the Global Energy and Water Cycle Experiment. Uh, was started in 1989. And it seemed to me that was a wonderful opportunity for hydrology and meteorology and climatology to connect, and I wanted to be part of that. And interestingly enough, the climate community wanted the hydrologists to be part of it because they felt that the land surface forcing in the atmosphere really mattered, and they needed some help with how to do that. And I could see that NOAA would fund some work to do this. And they, so I got involved. It was, I was just in the right place at the right time and got involved in doing that. And so from there I got interested in the hydrometeorological aspects of weather and climate prediction. Uh, and then finally, what these all these words mean about a seamless approach to weather, water, and climate prediction seemed to me something else that we could do. And I'd like to spend most of my time now talking about what happens down in those last couple of boxes. Weather, water, and climate in our future. I want to talk about three main topics and then some subtopics underneath the third one. A little bit of talk about clim climate variability and change and hydrologic response. I want to talk about weather and climate predictions. And I want to talk about hydrologic ensemble prediction. And I want to talk about aspects of that, the use of the atmospheric forecasts to get input for the hydrologic ensemble prediction. I want to talk about dealing with hydrologic uncertainty. Our models are not perfect and are not unbiased. And then I want to talk about, uh, I want to show you some of the first outputs that we're get, beginning to get in the weather service of how a hydrologic ensemble prediction system would work out here in California, where we actually make hindcasts using uh, hindcasts of the, the weather for the next two weeks to help with that work. What can we know? <clears throat> the, the point here is that, in, in my view, is that on the one hand we need to consider physics to help explain why things happen and that is where the skill comes from our prediction. But we also need to consider uncertainty to make the predictions more useful for making decisions. Now, in the climate variability and change area, one of the most interesting for me time series that shows some possible non-stationarity is a time series of the peak flows in the American River. And the American River is drains from the Sierras right here. This is the American River Basin. And there's a reservoir here, Folsom, that was built in about 1960, right in here. Now, at the time that reservoir was built, the, the only data that was available to know what kind of spillway capacity you needed was, and what kind of flood, so flood control reservoir too, what kind of flood storage capacity you need, was this data back in here. But after the reservoir was built, look what happened. And there's a National Academy or National Research Council study of this, and they concluded that this could not have come from a random 
series of independent observations from the same distribution. So there was a non-stationarity here. And they said in the report that that should be considered in what we do, but it didn't say how to do that. And so none of us really know how to do that. And I would like to suggest just strategically a way to think about what we might do here as part of my talk. Now, what we do know is that there are changes in temperatures <laughs> that have been occurring over the last several decades in North America, illustrated here by a slide from uh, Mike Dettinger, and that the effect of that temperature change has been to a big effect in the West <clears throat> on the occurrence of rain versus snow, which certainly should have some kind of a hydrologic effect. And, but in the end, we don't see that uh, signal in the stream flow in terms of at least the median flows in the West. There hasn't been a change over the period that we were looking at. And there's some increase in the East according to, or the Northeast, according to a study by the USGS. I uh, have, do a lot of work with our River Forecast Center in Sacramento and that's been one of the pilot areas for the development of our ensemble <clears throat> prediction system for the Weather Service. And so I thought I'd take a look at the data for the American River and to see if whether or not any of the climate changes that we've seen occur really show up in the stream flow itself, just to take a look at this. And I want to show you this because it seems to me it's just an example of how can we think about what's going on here, just a, a, a part of the, th the thought process. And so as I was preparing for our talk today, I thought, gee, I'd really like to take a look and see what's going on here. So what I did was I took the temperature time series that we use as input to our hydrology model for that area, historical, and it was used to calibrate the model. And I looked at the daily minimum temperatures, and we had a time series that went from 19... 65 in this case to 2000 and divided the the period into two parts a part from 1965 to 1980 and another part from 1991 to 2000 and I computed the mean minimum daily temperature time series smoothed it a little bit for each of those two periods subtracted the two and what you see is an increase in the daily minimum temperature during, an off, during the cooler part of the year. And as, over that period of a couple decades, the temperatures have increased as much as one degree Celsius during some times of the year in the winter. Now that means that the, there's a more possibility now of getting rain instead of snow and you might get faster melts. So I was curious to see if that kind of thing might show up in the flow record. So what I did was to look at the data that we had for just the upper part of the American Basin, the North Fork part, the unregulated part, so I didn't have to worry about reservoir effects. And what I did was to look at the way in which water accumulates during the year, what fraction of the total runoff occurs by a certain time of the year after the 1st of October. And the individual years, the accumulations go from zero to one. And there's a lot of noise in the way this works. And then over here, it shows you something about our models. They're very good at computing the total runoff. This is the simulated annual runoff for the period from 1960 to 1999, I think it is. And this is from 61 to, eight, uh, to 98. And this is what's observed. And that's, you don't see a lot of hydrologic model simulations that behave that well. So the model understands what's going on, I think, pretty well. And then what I looked at was the average value of these curves for the first half of this period and, and then the second half and, and drew the two here. What you see is that indeed there's some shift for an earlier runoff to occur. And this shift is close to about two weeks. 
but it doesn't begin shifting until about the 1st of March. So it's not shifting, it's not being caused by a shift of rain in the, in the December, January, February period. It's being caused by uh, something after a lot of that has accumulated. And then this is what the model thinks the shift looks like, and the model sees a stronger shift than what's actually observed to occur. I looked at the peak flows, the distribution of the peak daily flows during the two periods is here, and in fact, that distribution has shifted to the right in the second part of it, so there are larger peak flows occurring in the second part than in the first. Why that's happened, I'm not saying anything about why it's happened, just that it's a phenomenon that we could see. Over here, the simulated curves don't behave quite the same way. They actually agree up to a certain point, and they agree on where it ends, but in the middle over here, they don't get it right. So I looked at the, the relationship between the simulated annual peak flows, maximum flows, and the observed. And they fit pretty well, except for this area right in here. And I, we don't know why this is happening. I think some of it's temperature related. Temperature can make a huge switch. If it's above or below freezing, it's like a switch on and off. But we need to go look at it. But the point is, is that it's in the window here that these things mismatch. So. Our models are imperfect, so figuring out how to use models to make decisions about what's happening in a climate system, I think it's tricky. We need to be very careful of thinking that thing through. I think the research challenge dealing with this non-stationary problem is how can models and data be used together more effectively to make predictions regarding climate variability and change? We have to remember it takes a lot of data to quantify uncertainty, and we don't have that data, so can we get the models to help us? And so making use of models is especially important to better understand non-stationarity and possible future effects of anthropogenic change. In a, you know, for years we've looked at paleo climate approaches. And some of those paleo, especially the ones with like tree rings, only work where it's dry. Well, these models can work anywhere. But can we make, it, there must be information in those models that we could use. And we need to be thinking about how can we extract that. And in my opinion, the way we're doing this today is not creative. Our methods for downscaling from the climate models, IPCC climate models, to say what's happening in California, are, in my view, very, very weak. Because it doesn't matter what grid point you take to get the downscaling. You're going to make it work because of the way the thing happens to work. It doesn't consider the fact that the model may not know what's going on. You could take a grid point from Ethiopia and downscale it to California and it would work just as well as using the one in California. <laughs> Believe me. Okay, so we need some careful thought. And in Ethiopia, all the precipitation occurs in the summertime and in here it all occurs in the wintertime. And you could still make it work. So this is... Anyway, <laughs> weather and climate predictions. Next topic. Probabilistic, we want to be able to use weather and climate predictions to, for, our, for our work in the climate, long-term planning, and in terms of predicting the future for the next few days to the next few months and beyond. But the probabilistic forecast from raw ensemble forecast from the atmosphere are not rely very reliable due to the deficiencies in the forecast models and the ensemble methods, according to Tom Hamill, who was one of our leading scientists in the, in the uh, ensemble business, scientist at, in our environmental research labs in Boulder. And this particular uh, slide here is showing you the output from an ensemble forecast, atmospheric forecast, for today, for the period ending, at 10 a.m. today, just before this lecture started. And it's, you know, we're seeing precip north of here. And it, this is, the diagram is, in a qualitative way, very good. And so there's a lot of information in here. The trouble is that the numbers, you can't just literally put those numbers into a hydrology model and get out the kind of numbers that you'd like out the other end. So there's a lot of work to do to get from one to the other. Just to show you some of the issues, this is a, uh, some results from 
the um, global ensemble forecast model that's run by the Weather Service is an older version of the model than they're running currently operate in the operations, the newest model. But this model, this version of the model, is a fixed version. And there's hindcasts that were made of this thing that go back to 1979. And we want to use those hindcasts as part of our work. And what this is showing, it's a two and a half degree grid here, that during the month of July, the mean for a, about a three year period that we had, at, when in this, we did this work, uh, of the, all the ensemble members for July for days, for forecasting for days one, two, three, there's a, 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 a spin up effect in the climatology of the model output that you see here. And down here is the mean precept that w from gauges that occurred over those areas at that time. And you see there's very strong wet bias in here. And you also see that point by point, that if the, the value from the gauges and the value from the model is very different, very noisy, and this drives a hydrology model nuts. So we must deal with this bias problem. But it's not simple to do that because this, the wet, that wet point down there in Georgia, if you just look at that one grid point and look at all of the ensemble member values, the distribution of those, you get this distribution here, this green line. And if you look at all the distribution of the values that, that were measured, you get this, this dark line. And if you were to take just for each, pro, for constant probability levels, you take the two points that you see here and use the green one for X and the blue one for Y, you get this curve that goes like this. And what this is showing you is that the model typically overestimates tremendously all the little events, and then it way underestimates the big events. So the adjustment that's needed is not a linear one. It's not a constant one. And you have no idea of what the adjustment is for up in here with a short record. We don't know what that is if you only have a few, few events. So you can't just take the last months of data and say what happened with precept and try to make an adjustment and do anything worthwhile. What else is striking is that the bias was the factor too, too wet, and it all came from all these little events. So the model drizzles all the time, and it, and it makes it wet, and there's nothing happening, and there's a problem with that. Much more interesting is, the, uh, is this result here. This data, the data that I used to make this, came from the North Fork of the American River again. And what I was interested in, the, the global ensemble forecast model, goes out for, uh, for two weeks. And we want to run our models at six hour time steps, so there's four time steps a day times two weeks is 56 time steps. And what I was looking at was the correlation coefficient between the mean aerial precept that we analyzed as input to our hydrology model for the North Fork for the upper zone of it. This is for the precipitation in areas above 5,000 feet. So this is for the area of the North Fork that's above Blue Canyon that's right up on I-80 up here. And what, the correlation between what was predicted and what occurred. And you see that the correlation decreases with lead time. There's some diurnal cycle in it. But then I was interested in if instead of looking at each individual time step, I looked at the total amount of precipitation that had accumulated and the correlation between what was predicted and observed. And you get this purple curve. And it increases, it goes way up, and after four or five days it reaches a peak or after a first day or two, but stays up for quite a, few, quite a while here, and look at what else. At the end of two weeks, we can predict a two-week total as well as the first six-hour period. That is amazing. So the whole story is between these two things. So we have a temporal scale-dependent uncertainty that we need, to, the hydrology is responding to all of this. And we need to include, make sure that when we drive our ensemble prediction system, that the multi-scale uncertainty and the variability of the processes is well represented. This is a neat challenge, and we, no, nobody knows how to do this well, or as well as we might, and there, we need a lot of ideas. If you, instead of, of starting at, times, at the 
time zero, you wait a day and then start a window and look at the accumulations and how it correlates. You get this next curve and you shift it down, you get the next curve. What happens is there's really a surface here, a correlation surface. And what you have going out this way is the forecast lead time to the beginning of some window. And if the, the, on this axis, the first window is at six hour duration. And so the curve that came down here is what the surface looks like, the profile of that surface along this axis. And this is looking at the, uh, the predictions from kind of a weather perspective. But if you look at the accumulations, we have on this scale the window width that we're looking at. And so this top line is what the surface looks like along this axis. And these other curves that started later but had windows that kept increasing go up here. So the real problem includes all of this, not just one part, not just a weather. And this is kind of a, I would call it sort of a climate perspective. We're looking at statistics of what happens for longer and longer integrations. What we need is a seamless weather and climate approach that looks at this whole space and looks at how this works as you go out. Hydrologic ensemble prediction. I have a couple of sub areas to talk about here, and I think I've got almost enough time to do some of it. At least 20, 25 more? Oh, good. All right. This is working better than I thought. I, uh, but we certainly care about many, many kinds of applications of the information we can have about the rivers. The bread and butter of the Weather Service Program started in a flood prediction system. We were looking at single value deterministic predictions out to maybe a couple of days. But the need for information about the rivers goes way beyond that for many, many purposes, including some environmental purposes that are not well illustrated by all these slides. Ensemble prediction involves making not just one prediction of what the river is going to do, but many. And so we start out with precipitation. Uh, the input information that we tend to have is single value predictions, but we can turn those single value predictions into alternative realizations that might occur given that we had that single value prediction. It's not clear that the atmospheric ensemble members actually have very much information about what's going to happen. They're imperfect. It's not to say there's not information in that ensemble set of members, but the ensemble mean is a neat way of filtering out noise. And at this point, until we can learn better how to use the members, we are in our program in the Weather Service starting to use just the mean value. And in this case, we had a, a QPF, a quantitative precipitation forecast. It was produced by a river forecast center in Sacramento of a one and a half inch for two six hour periods and it was zero otherwise. And this is what came out of the, the preprocessor that, that creates the, the, the time series to go in the hydrology models. And what happens is that the hydrologists are somewhat risk averse and they also know the hydrology models are nonlinear and they respond to large events more than small events. So they're gonna put these numbers into the hydrology models, so what happened is, is 1.5 1 1 inches in each of the six hour periods is a bigger number than if, you, I don't know if you can read these numbers, but it's up in here somewhere. And so most of the members, so it's biased high. And then there's a possibility of getting rain even though they said zero, so you get all these other members. When you look at the temperature kinds of, in, of ensemble inputs that we get, they look something like this at six hour time steps. and what you see is there's a, you know, a diurnal cycle in it. You see the uncertainty getting greater as, the, as you move out into the future. But what you also see is that the temperature tends to be persistent in time. And what we do is we use the historical structure of the data and constrain it with the probability information from the present to produce this kind of stuff. And you put that in, you get a hydrology response. And because the temperatures can be close to freezing. In this case, most of them are above freezing, but there are many of these that we can see where more of it is below freezing. That winds up, if you get a lot of low flow outputs from the, 
from the model when in temperatures are real cold. So this is uh, sort of an ensemble prediction. So rather than making one prediction of what's going to happen here, we actually try to get many and then make some probability statements about what we can expect to have. This is just for a five-day period. Now, a hydrologic ensemble prediction system needs to have observations to go into it. It needs weather and climate forecasts. It needs hydrologic models. And it, we also need to have information about upstream regulation. Very frankly, the highest priority need in the Weather Service is for, infor, for ways to, to account for this in the future. Some of this may be known, and some of it may be unknown, and even the part that's known isn't known for sure. So this is a, a great challenge, and then we want to put that into some kind of a system here. What, what does this system look like? Well, it's got a lot of parts to it. It has uh, the OBS come into what we call a land data, a land data simulator. This includes some analysis of the observations and then some way that those observations get used to get the initial conditions to go into the processor here. This is not something that we have focused that much on. There are big issues on how to do the observations analysis. And we really need, to, traditionally what we do with observations, we try to get the best analysis we can of them. But there's a lot of uncertainty in those analysis. The hydrology models respond to that. We need ensemble analyses of this. And so we're beginning to look into that. We need to process the atmospheric forecasts, and we use a preprocessor to get a statistical relationship between what comes in from here to get reliable hydrologic inputs and precip and temperature mainly here. Then we have our models. We put that through some kind of a processor here. We make ensemble forecasts that are biased and, and don't have their uncertainty right either. Just as, in fact, I think the problems we have here are actually greater than the atmospheric model problems. They're trickier because of the nonlinearity of the system. And then, we, so we need to have some kind of a, a product generator and post processor that can produce the reliable products. We need verification tools and we need a role for the forecaster. We know that the forecasters have improved our single value predictions traditionally. They can add value and will add value, I'm sure, to what we're doing in this system, but we have to redefine that role. And we need their help to do that. The, we, as we do this, we've got to remember that we're not just working with some little single basin somewhere. We really need to do this in a way that we consider the dendritic structure of the system. You've got upstream-downstream relationships. You've got tributaries coming together. And you've got to get it so that on ensemble member number one from one of these points has a similar meaning in the terms of what the whole weather and climate regime is doing uh, as member number one from any other point in this system. And we must be able to do that so that as we come all the way down through the Mississippi River Basin over here, that it all makes sense and it hangs together at all time steps. So how you take information from different models and connect all that together and get this to work well is a really great challenge. So we have many kinds of things we've got to work on. It's a very complicated issue dealing with the observation uncertainties, the future forcing, upstream regulation, model uncertainties. So this, these challenges are, are, it seemed to us that they were much greater than we in the United States were going to do by ourselves. And we'd be better off to work together with the rest of the world. And it, I could see that there was a lot of interest in Europe, especially in this area. So we started a project that we call the Hydrologic Ensemble Prediction Experiment, APEX. And I want to show you a little bit about it. We have had a number of workshops. They kicked it off at the ECMWF in Reading in March of 2004. I'm incredibly indebted to Tony Hollingsworth, who was head of the research program there. They're, they were doing ensemble prediction, beginning to develop that, uh, starting back in the 90s, and he wanted us to use this stuff. So I suggested to him that they go host this workshop, and he agreed to do it. And uh, we've had then several more. We had another one in, at NCAR. We have had one in, uh, in Italy, in uh, ISPRA, hosted by the European Union's Joint Research Center. 
We had one in Del Terry's in Delft, hosted by them on a post-processing in 2008. We just finished one at Medio France in uh, Toulouse this past June. At this last one, we had more than 100 people from 20-some countries uh, participating. This one was focused on the pre-processing. The, some of these have focused on specific parts of the problem, and most of the ones that we will have in the future will tend to focus on parts of the problem, not just everything, although we'll see. <clears throat> We've had a number of articles and journals and special issues. We have a number of projects that we call testbed projects, We're beginning to work on some data sets, and we are also hoping to build some components of a community hydrologic prediction system. The atmospheric scientists have done very well in building community systems. We would like to move in that direction in hydrology if we can. Now I'd like to talk about the, how, what's my time now? 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Just go real quick through a couple of the tasks and some of the work to build this system. On the preprocessor, this is actually today's forecast from the global forecast system that was made a few days ago for what the precip would be for the total day starting at 4 a.m. today to 4 a.m. tomorrow. You see very similar to the other one for the last three hours, but it looks like we may get wet later today and tonight uh, if this is right. The uh, way we handle the Pre-processing at this point in time, and this is only one way to do this, is to make it a two-step process. We start out with the raw atmospheric forecast. What we want is the time series like you saw every six hours, members going out for the next uh, nine months, if we can do that, from different model inputs. And we decompose it into two parts. You remember that triangular sort of diagram of the correlation I showed you. Well, each point in that surface represents an event. And e for a future period, for starting from the forecast we make today, that event that has a, an average over some time and starting in a future time, we can make a probability estimate, probability distribution estimate of what that event's going to look like. And there's a very large number of these events for any one future forecast that we could do this for. But what we want to go into our models is not those, not those probability distributions. We need the time series, the actual numbers, that have those probability properties. So somehow we have to get a time series that's constrained to have these numbers, given that we had the forecast that came in that told us what these pro helped us make these probability distributions. So our strategy for that is to, since the actual space-time structure of the uncertainty is unknown, and of the actual distribution of the events that are going to occur is unknown, what we're doing for now is using the historical data and using the structure of it with something that <coughs> Michael, uh, that uh, Martin Clark and Lauren Hay uh, put together after talking to me, and they called it the Shockey Shuffle. It's a whole story behind why that name. But basically, it, if you know what a copula is, it uses the historical data as a copula to create the, the do the sampling from these probability distributions. It's an empirical copula approach. And when you do that, what happens is we remove bias. The uh, the global forecast system, this is looking again at the North Fork, the upper zone of it, is two, the, the global forecast system has a two and a half degree grid. The North Fork of the American River area is a few hundred square kilometers. And yet there's information about that 200 square kilometers from that big grid because the system is really a large scale system. And so the bias, but because the grid elevation, the grid, the model doesn't even know about the Sierras, is very low. Its precipitation is low compared to what's observed to occur. You got biases, and it varied during the year. The model takes that bias out. When you measure the the skill of the thing using the continuous rank probability score, and making a skill score out of it by comparing the predictions to climatology 
you wind up with skill scores in the raw data that look like this. After running through the processor, the skill is enhanced immensely, and we start seeing very strong skills. The, this, uh, this is for five days going out here. This is for the individual six-hour periods, and then this is for various aggregate periods beyond that. So the, the events are where we sampled from that triangular space, and you're seeing that in the accumulations is where all the information content is. The idea of using multiple models is an important one. This is a slide from work that uh, Eric Wood's group at Princeton has been doing, and they, they were looking at long-range predictions and looking at models, uh, data from a project called Demeter that was conducted over in Europe. And they had four different climate models or four different long-range models that ran, and then they have a way of combining the information. And what you see is this, this, this is, again, looking at correlations. Similar to that triangular diagram, you're looking at, at lead times here on this scale, you're looking at window accumulations here, and what you're seeing is that long range, like seasonal predictions, have skill. And they're better, you have more skill if you combine all this, then this is a correlation scale here, so you want to be up in this area of brown. And you see the shorter lead times and the longer lead times, the integrations. Uh, have a considerable amount of skill. So we want to get the, all that into our models. So our research challenge is here, how to pre-process pre atmospheric forecasts to get the seamless weather to climate type approach, and then how to combine the forecast information from multiple models. And then still do this so that you have time series for all the members that make sense, all the way to the bottom of the Mississippi River Basin, for example. We have to fix our hydrology model outputs in a similar way. We have the raw inputs. We want to adjust the outputs. And I have only one equation in this slide, and I don't expect you to understand it totally, but it's there for a reason. There's a strategy associated with it. It's called the total probability law. And the idea behind this is that if we can calibrate the atmospheric forcing so that we put into our hydrology models numbers that our hydrology models understand. So they have the same kind of climatology characteristics that, that were used to calibrate the model. Then what we can do is simply try to describe the relationship between what we our model simulates versus what's observed so that we can make a prediction of what will happen given the total forecast system. This Y-OBS is actually a time series, and so we're trying to predict the, uh, the ensemble, really, of future events that will be measured given we have this forecast system. And if we can decompose this, we can make, we can break the problem up so we can just run a preprocessor that accounts for the model error. And so if we can get it so that when we get the model simulation, we can ma map it with a bunch of alternative futures into something the observed is down here where it contains the observed values. And if we can do that consistently, not perfectly, then we can take this information to adjust the ensemble predictions and make better predictions. Our research challenge is there, how to represent the, the, the temporal multi-scale relationship between the model and the simulations that actually occur. This is an incredibly interesting uh, kind of problem. And then how to model known and unknown of aspects of upstream regulation. And what we hope is, is that just this approach here will count for some of the unknown regulation effects. So we'll see. Some initial stream flow hindcasts, I'm just about finished now, uh, is we are looking here at the correlation between what we compute and what we observe, what the ensemble mean flow that it comes out and what's observed. And this is the correlation for, this is uh, for different uh, times of the year here, between what the model simulation looks like when you force it with the analyzed precip and temperature data. And it gets better as you look at accumulations into the future. And if you just force the model with uh, past precipitation and temperature data, so there's no skill in those, quote, forecasts, just climatological forecasts, which is the way we started making our ensemble stream flow predictions years ago. 
you get a much lower correlation with what actually happens. And it, you lose skill as you move into the future because the initial conditions affect it at different times of the year more than others. But if you use the first two weeks of prediction, you actually make a significant improvement in what you had here. Even though we're going to run this out for 30 days, the precip forecast was just in the first two weeks, you can get a lot of information out of this. We don't have into this the forecast from the climate forecast system at this point because we don't have an archive of those data in the period from 15 days out to 30 days that adds any skill to this at the present time. Some of the challenges is how that comes from this is how can we communicate uncertainty to our users? Major issue. How can the users use this information to make better decisions? What kind of hindcast information do they need? And then in the end, from a user perspective, how should the computer resources that we have in, say, NOAA be used to do all this prediction? There are trade-offs between model resolution, number of members, whether you make hindcast or you don't, how, fa how often do you change the models? There's huge issues using tremendous resources that users should have some input to, and they don't right now. Some of the research challenges that, when you step back and look at all this, we really need to look better at how we analyze observations and try, right now we try to produce a best estimate, but we really need ensemble uh, techniques. Uh, we're working on this in the HAPEX project, by the way. And then we also need to think about how, you know, we have different data sources. We have satellites of various kind coming in. We've got radar data. We used to have them years ago. How can we produce analyses from different data sources or with a consistent climatology for long historical periods so that we can use all these for the hind casting function and possibly for the model calibration? Some quick messages here. All models are imperfect and nothing can be known for sure, obviously. I think we're beginning to learn how to extract information from models and data, including uncertainty in a reliable way. There's no one best model, and maybe several of the best imperfect models may be better than any one. Uh, I was just talking to Norm Crawford, who developed the Stanford Watershed model uh, back when I was getting my degree. I'd have gotten to know him much better if I'd have gone to, Harvard, uh, to uh, Stanford than Harvard. And we have a model we use in the Weather Service called Sacramento model. They're very similar, but I think if we used them together, we could do much better. So it'd be neat to come back and try to do some of that kind of stuff from my point of view. And the scientific foundation for hydro hydrologic prediction requires support from our National Science Agency, NSF, that can be implemented by all the science agencies, not just research that is research for its own sake. A quote from Lord Kelvin related to what I think some of the priorities for NSF ought to be is, there cannot be a greater mistake than that of looking superciliously upon practical applications of science. The life and soul of science is its practical application. And in the Weather Service, we have, or in NOAA, we've been putting together a strategic document on what we think we need to see happen in research to help us. And this was prepared under the direction of Pedro Restrepo, who's our chief scientist now in the Weather Service. Uh, and uh, it's a wonderful document. And so as we look ahead as to where we want to go, I hope that what's in this document might be thought about very seriously. Final slide. What was this talk really all about? Well, I have tried to present some science perspectives of water, weather, and climate prediction for you to think about. I tried to provide some credibility for those ideas in terms of looking at how my career led me to believe that that stuff matters. And then I've really enjoyed working with young people, and so I hope that they found that you younger folks found this rewarding. We tried to, I tried to show what some of the research opportunities are for you. And then uh, just a quick quote from Richard Feynman, who was a famous physicist who led the uh, Roberts Commission report on the uh, Challenger disaster.
back in uh, 1985. And he, his note is that, that science is a way of trying not to fool yourself. And the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. Many of you have had me come up to your posters and ask you questions, hard questions like, why did you do that? What did you do? What did you learn? And then, how did you know that you did what you thought you did? <laughs> ask yourself that question. Thank you. Uh, we have time for questions from the audience, and the lights are shining brightly, so it may be hard to see a, a hand held up. But uh, questions? Oh, come on. No, I have a I have a question which uh, I'll ask John while we're we're waiting here, and that is, uh, what are, what are the uh, ramifications of the fact that we have such a difficult time assessing uncertainty and making predictions in current technology. Oh, that's a good question. <clears throat> one, one thing I'd like to point out is, is that in the end it is subjective judgment that leads to decisions. People make decisions, not computer models. This provides guidance. And so all that, the, all the probability things can do is provide some kind of guidance and decision support. So I think people make decisions based on their judgment. And the, without ha we could have better information that would lead to better decisions. But it's not like we can't do it if we don't know. And we simply use our judgment more. And also there was an interesting article that uh, Roger Pilkey Jr. wrote in the uh, a recent issue of the GWEX newsletter uh, where he suggested that maybe we shouldn't be trying to do all these probabilities, that maybe we ought to be making decisions without them and look for strategies that can do that. So I think we need to be mindful that not everything is probabilities, but that would provide a better basis for scientific decision making potentially. Um, but we have got a long way to go to get the probabilities right and I think we need to be careful to see if we've actually been able to do that. Uh, Dennis. Dennis? Yeah. Hi, Dennis. Thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, I, thank you. But the, Dennis, Dennis said, you know, I was pretty critical a while ago about some of the downscaling methods that are used. And uh, that's a great comment coming from Dennis because his group created most of these. And uh, he didn't do it alone. Uh, he's got uh, cohorts here that are good friends of mine that have done this as well. And the question is, is there a better way? Well, the reason I'm critical is because the, the, down, the easiest downscaling technique to use is to take the cumulative distribution of what the observed is and the cumulative distribution of what the model said and map from the model values to the, the probability matching approach to match from one to the other. The trouble is that doesn't consider whether or not the model has any skill whatsoever about what's happening. And what we need is to... Uh, work on ways that consider the skill of the model at the same time. Now one of the people that's helped to create those techniques with Dennis is Andy Wood that, that's sitting right here. And Andy and I have collaborated on trying to get a better answer to this question, to take into account the information content of the model relative to the thing you're trying to predict. And how can you do that? Well, doing that in terms of ensemble prediction where you're looking at the future is a little easier because now you can look at the correlation between what the model predicted and what's going to happen. It's the same event. But in the climate sense, that's not the case. The, the model's trying to get the climate behavior. And so how do you know whether you have what you want or not? 
And I honestly don't know how to do that, except that I think the key is in looking at the variability of the system in terms of more than just where you are right at the present time and trying to understand, looking for some measure of information relationship between the variability that's coming out of the model and what's happening. It's going to involve diagnostic tools to see what's going on. But just taking this simple probability matching is you could make that, like I say, work. You could take any grid square out of Ethiopia and do probability matching to get the one here, and it would work. But what does it tell you? Because it's all the other relationships that are going on. Things, variability and uncertainty is space and time scale dependent. What is the space time scale structure? And the model doesn't get it perfectly. And so what, is the, what can they tell, the model tell us about it when we only have a limited set of data? With the, we don't have time to go into it. I have some ideas of experiments I could do with you to just understand what maybe some of the limitations are and it might lead to helping us get better technique. Dennis, your question's wonderful. I wish I knew more about the answer. Hopefully there's some bright people here that would feel challenged to think about what could we do that would be better than probability matching, and I know we can do better. Any other questions? Yeah. Slow Oh, right now we're just using the ensemble mean. The question is, if I heard it right, is what, using other parts of the weather forecast than just the ensemble mean, and could you use those? And the answer is we'd sure like to. The reason we're not doing it yet is because people like Tom Hamill and Jeff Whitaker and looking especially at the, the global forecast system could not see that the the spread information in the ensemble from the global ensemble correlated with the difference between the ensemble mean and what was observed. So the error, if you will, didn't relate to the, the, the model wasn't that knowledgeable about what was actually happening. So we, it's an area we need to look at. But I don't think you can just look at a probability level and use it because we actually need the whole time series. And so that, 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 that I'm not saying you can't do it, it's just that one has to be mindful that if you do, you really need to look at how to translate that back into the ensemble members. So some way to adjust those raw ensembles might be useful. I think there's a challenge left with that too because you have more than one model for different periods of time and you've got all these different ensemble members from all these different models. How are you going to combine them to get the whole thing working down to the Mississippi River uh, going out for the next nine months? How, you, how do you stitch all that together? Uh, it's uh, huge challenges in here and and at the same time preserve all the multi-scale uncertainty. So what we're doing in my view is a very, very, very preliminary embryonic approach. The only thing I can say is I think it's going to be hard to beat. Right, uh, Mike uh, Dettinger asked, uh, are we going to build into it the upstream management part of this? And the answer is absolutely we must. We can't make predictions downstream without including management effects, known and unknown, from the upstream. You know, the USGS put together this excellent hydroclimatic data network of stream gauges. Well, the largest drainage area of any of those in the United States is about 10,000 square kilometers, which is an area of about one square degree because there's regulated flows everywhere else in the country. So we must do this, and I don't know how we're going to do it. For, hopefully that post-processing will clean up some of it, but uh, where you've got major reservoirs and they're not necessarily operated the way they say they're going to, the operators don't know what they're going to do either exactly, and we need to get that straight. And so we need to work with the agencies on how we're going to do it. 
and uh, it's a team effort that's needed. HAPEX is not working on that question yet, by the way. Well, thank you, John. Thank you. I think we'll bring the questioning to a close, and thank you all for coming this morning. <laughs> Thanks again, John. <laughs> well, it was nice. I, oh, it was a thrill to do that, yeah. to be given that up.